Mm -hmm. Point well made. Sure. Thank you. So I, I want to, I, my questions are on the impact of households. You've covered some of the points, but um, just to just to uh, just to put it into context, um, what we've had over the last few years, of course, is the backdrop of Brexit and the costs associated with that, COVID costs, mm. um, and then we've got the the bigger, longer-term issues around energy transition and climate, and now conflict. So um, the the points you're making about thinking through the long term is well made and in fact um, one of the one of the things it seems that some of the other countries especially the Chinese um, uh, and India to some extent these Asian economies are being able to do is think much more longer term uh, we may not like some of the things they're doing but they are being much less reactive <laughs> one would argue so looking looking to the future um, you you talked about um, the cost to businesses um, investment, you know, has it was down post Brexit anyway. What sort of scale of numbers are we looking at in terms of investment in businesses, and what sort of investment are we looking for um, in terms of taking the edge off households, both low income households, but also you know, middle, you know, other other others who are kind of on the edge of, if you like, struggling lower middle class families with fixed earnings um, are struggling too because of the rise in cost of living. What sort of, what sort of numbers are we looking at in terms of what the Chancellor should be trying to respond to? And there is, of course, the longer term, but there's the, there is, unfortunately, an immediate challenge here, given what's happening internationally. For, question for all of you, really. I'll give a brief answer, then I'll Thank give you. time for others to, 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 to come in. Um, I, I, I mean, certainly we could we ought to be rethinking the, the tapering of universal credit and thinking again about whether more households could be, could be offered uh, an extension to that in the way that it was taken away in September 2021. We've also been trying to think of a, win, um, a winter grant scheme that uh, could be potentially uh, put together at the local authority level um, that would allow households that are facing an increase in energy bills up to what was we thought in February was about £900, might well be nearer £2,000 by now. This is an enormous ha amount for households in the lower part of the income spectrum. So we need to address that, I think, and try to think of a grant scheme so they can meet their energy uh, bills. I've already mentioned more support for food banks as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd also really want to consider whether it's a good idea to bring in the national insurance tax um, hike uh, just now, it could be postponed. I understand that it's been hypothecated to help with social and health care. Uh, but right now, it may not be a, a sensible thing to hit those mm -hmm. households who are just earning enough to pay it. Yep. it. It is mildly progressive, but it's not terribly progressive. And one could certainly also think about uh, the alternative of an income tax on higher earners, even on a temporary basis, yep. to fund things uh, at the moment and just help those poorer households. Uh, and I go back to asking for more support for food banks and also support for uh, higher education and further education colleges that could well provide online educational services for people as well as grants for people to study. These are all the kinds of things or a set of issues I think could be introduced. I know this is a value judgment qu yes. kind of qu question uh, that require value-based mm. answer, but do you think that there is a, what, what happened with the COVID response mm. and the government's response was, you know, on a national scale for diff all households to varying degrees, that because this issue is hitting certain households harder, it's not getting the traction despite, um, despite the pressure on government to do yeah. something about the cost of living crisis and uh, fuel costs going mm. up, even though we've got a, a now conflict that's fueling that further. Is that what's going on and, uh, in terms of the urgency of this situation? Um, I'll give a brief answer, because I know there will be yeah, people here who know more sure. about this. But, but I, I, I think, as, as, as Tony said, we're imagining this war has been going on for a long time. It's, it's just a couple of weeks. It's been dominant in all our thoughts. Yeah. It shocked us all. Yeah. And, and maybe it's just caused us, and rightly, to think what we can do for the people who have been directly affected sure. by it, the Ukrainian migrants what we can do to help them and also the Eastern European countries that are dealing with a massive flow of immigration and, and maybe haven't got the fiscal or other resources to deal with that. So we've been focused on that. But yes, you're right, we need to turn eventually the spotlight on those households that have already had payments problems um, in result of the increase in energy prices towards the end of next year, but increasingly will face that over the course of this year. 
And I think it's incredibly important that we do draw attention to that, particularly as it's something that is so regionally um, diverse as well. There are parts of the country that will be more sorely affected by this than others. It undermines the levelling up agenda. Absolutely. So, Tony, you talked about investment and inflation, input costs, labour shortage, energy prices. It's a bewildering number of challenges for businesses. What's the sort of scale of investment that's needed in in numbers in this forthcoming statement, but also longer term? What what do you think the business community needs to try and um, stabilise confidence, both business confidence and, and the associated consumer confidence that could take take us down a recessionary route if we don't act now? Well, look, I think the first thing, focusing on immediacy, so I would echo uh, all of Jagjit's views about uh, low-paid households, uh, use of universal credit, targeting on how we, uh, how we put that situation first. I think the second thing to say in terms of urgency, uh, and, and it's interesting, the, the reference to COVID, is I think what you've got now is a lot of businesses, in particular smaller firms, whose energy costs yep. are simply unaffordable. And so they're under massive cash flow strain. So I think the, the Chancellor did a very good job of having a toolbox to help firms with cash flow. I think he's going to need to extend those, be that loan schemes or deferred payments, uh, because you know we created a soft landing so that firms could move on to invest. I'm not suggesting that this crisis is exactly like COVID. I don't think it is. But the same principle applies, which is, I think, some cash flow support, the government using its balance sheet rather than necessarily Dell spending would be uh, advisable. Uh, I think there's also energy intensive industries, which we haven't talked about today, but are particularly badly hit in the UK. Coming back to investment, look, I think that uh, I think the first thing to remember is the UK is currently uh, bottom of the G7 league table on business investment. Uh, I think that has to change. Uh, I think the Chancellor will only have un, unattractive fiscal choices unless we get business investment up. It's going to be the only way we can get growth moving. I think he's acknowledged that in the May's lecture. And therefore, one, one should sort of quantify what it costs to allow business investment policy like the super deduction. You won't need to be that expensive to stimulate. We cost the uh, permanent 100% investment deduction in our budget submission at something like £8 billion. So I think there are me- measures that the government can take that will unlock what we think might be £40 billion worth of business investment. So I think that's some numbers on it. I think if the government incentivizes that activity, it will more than pay for itself. Uh, I do think in the long run, we one of the areas where we're very uncompetitive, ironic given this discussion, is on renewable energy markets. So by our estimates, uh, the gov- we as a country invest something that less than 1% on renewable energy uh, uh, markets and investment, compared to something like 1.8% in the EU, 3.4% in the US. Now, the government can therefore either choose to compete with Joe Biden's government and the German government and the European government on public subsidy for renewable energy. I don't think it will. And therefore, I think it's incumbent upon them to think much more creatively about market making. Right? Offshore wind is the success story for the UK creating highly investable private sector investment in renewable energy. And we are still waiting for the government to come forward with plans for hydrogen, carbon capture, and so on. So I think if the government doesn't want to try and match European and American governments on public investment, it has to think far more radically about how to unlock private sector investment. Because certainly for green projects, the volume of funding available is huge. Okay, thank you. Just one one last question, um, which is linked back to... um, uh, the um, impact on households. Um, the UK is already in the middle of a cost of living crisis, even before Ukraine. Um, Torsten Bell uh, of the Resolution Foundation said that the conflict in Ukraine means that this will be the deepest squeeze on living standards since the 70s, with real incomes falling by 4%. Um, do you all agree with that assessment? And is there anything else you want to add about what the government should be doing, um, either in the next um, budget statement or uh, subsequently to mitigate that reduction, rather dramatic I mean, reduction in living standards? Just, just, just briefly, I mean, this, this um, gas and oil price rise has been quite insidious. And the energy yeah. sector, the oil and gas sector, doesn't really get much attention apart from when things are going going a bit wrong and um, but i think the what's going to ha- what is happening is diesel prices are now at 10 year highs but half of that is fuel duties and vat uh, energy bills though this is the harder one we're going to go from you know it's 1200 pounds 1300 pounds for an average energy bill last october 
going to £2,000 in April, going to, based on current gas prices, over £3,000 in October. But 70% of that, sorry, yep. <laughs> of that £3,000 is actually the wholesale price. So there's not so much, if you like, um, VAT is only 5%. So it's not that much. Not make a difference. There's not going to make a lot of difference. So that it, it, it's coming, and there's not a great deal on the energy bill side you can do about it. On the fuel side, but then that's subsidising oil and gas, which I guess is the difficult sort of conundrum that, that we're in at the moment. And in terms of cost of subsidising households, I mean, I think I gave these numbers earlier as well. It is anywhere between 25 billion pounds to 50 to 60 billion, yeah. right? Yeah. But if we are talking about the you know the really poorer households. Mm -hmm those kind of subsidies will have to be given and announced. Uh, but also, to Tony's point in terms of renewable, I mean, we think we need at least $20 billion per year in terms of investment in renewables. And yep. again, that can lift business confidence and yep. at least helps mitigate the impact on the economy. Sorry, just one final question. Are we, given, given the various things you've all said, are we heading for a recession? Well, I, I think it's soon, too soon to make soon that to pronouncement, okay. but I, I, I think what's interesting about the Resolution Foundation work is not only that we're about to have the deepest squeeze, but it's the longest yeah. squeeze. I think, I think it's the length that changes the nature of economic decision-making now for the Chancellor, for the government, for all of us. Uh, first thing to say is I think we now need to think about a medium-term growth plan and productivity plan, because I think... Uh, all the growth forecasts for not this year but next year are, are heading towards 1% growth a year. And I just think what that really does to the fiscal position and the position facing the Chancellor is, you know, you've got four levers in the end, right? You've got spending and, nobody, and nothing looks like we're going to be able to cut spending anytime soon. You've got tax and we're about to hit the highest tax burden in 70 years. Mm -hmm. You've got debt and the government say they don't want to uh, move on that. And you've got growth. And... We need to take action on one of them because at the moment it doesn't add up. Yeah, and my own view is, I understand, Judge, it said we might be able to do a bit more with debt, but certainly growth is the number that worries me the most. Yeah. And I think if we are not investing in growth, then either you have to borrow more uh, or you have to uh, spend less or tax more. And I don't think these are meaningful options. So I think the growth plan is the thing that's missing for me. It needs to be not a growth plan for this yeah. year because, you know, growth has bounced back because of the crisis. It's a growth plan for the next five years and yep. it needs to achieve higher levels than we have today. I, I, I think the risk of a recession are very, very high because to Nathan's point, this is not just oil and gas, it's raw materials, it's fertilizers, food. We may not be there, we may not be able to say it yet, but it's very, very high. And is that, is that a global, global Europe more Europe, so than yeah. global, but yes, I think Europe, Europe, UK takes the bigger hit and then yes, globally as well. Anyone else want to add? Anything to that question? I, I, I think at current um, energy and oil prices, the UK is skirting very close to a, yep. a fall in activity. It's going to be hovering around zero next year at current prices. And if we think a significant sequence of negative numbers corresponds to a recession, that looks likely, but not necessary next year. Um, just very briefly, in, in terms of the um, size of the state, I mean, we're right. We don't want... Um, to see debt levels escalate in terms of public debt, but we need to bear in mind, going back to the investment question, that public investment over the last 40 years has probably been about half uh, what it ought to have been uh, on average over that 40-year period, which has meant that the public capital stock is far below where it might be. Yeah. There are shortages in FDI as well. And when we talk about business investment, it's not only taxes that affect the level of business investment, there's also been an incredible degree um, of economic uncertainty in our trade links. Uh, for obvious reasons to, since 2016, and again from COVID, and again now. So it's a real important question is how we offset that, and that's where we go back to the idea of a plan. But in the end, what determines the standard of living is productivity, mm. is how well we produce things. And if we have an increase in our costs, and we don't produce things in a more efficient manner, then it will unfortunately mean we're poorer than we'd otherwise be. Mm. The question then for the government is, do we take that hit in one year, or do we try and smooth it over time? Now, we'd be, I think we're all in favour of smoothing it if we can, but the long-run end point is the same. Uh, and unless we change the way that we do things, we're going to be materially poorer than we'd otherwise be. And that's where a long-run growth plan or productivity plan comes into place. But also, as I said earlier, a focus 
on the long run, a ministry of the economy. Just to pick up one point, it's not only China and India who think long run, Norway, uh, Singapore, there are many examples around the world of countries who do think over the long run, provide physical and human infrastructure on an ongoing basis that allow people to plan and leave countries less vulnerable to the kind of shocks that we're, we're now unfortunately having to respond to. Thank you.